So I've been, I've been dealing with something personally. I don't like dealing with stuff personally. Do you all like dealing with stuff personally? And the other day it really hit me hard. And I realized, I realized what it was. In a split second, I was with Karen. I said, you know, this is what happened to me. But then it was like the Lord put all these verses in. And so when the Lord adds verses, when you're dealing with something, you kind of know, yeah, I'm trying to deal with you. Would you mind if I just touch you in this area? I'm like, I don't really want to deal with that, God. I thought I'd already dealt with that. And uh, one of the things I'm very aware of is that none of us have dealt with everything. And in fact, sometimes when we think we've dealt with something, we actually haven't dealt with it. We just managed to overcome for a period of time where that wasn't first and foremost in our mind. And so the Lord began speaking to me about something, and he said, Danny, this is important for relationships for people, what you want to share. He says, they have to know this. I was like, why? He said, because if they don't get this part, they're, they're gonna, uh, their whole life, they're going to feel rejection. And you aren't supposed to be living with rejection. I mean, they rejected the prophets. It's one thing if you're rejected as a prophet. Right, Will? <laughs> and, and it's one thing if we're rejected for knowing Jesus. That's fine. But you're not supposed to live with relationships that just continually, there's a turnover all the time where you're just feeling rejected, rejected, rejected. And yet we step into that. In fact, sometimes we do things that absolutely create the re rejection in our life. And Am I talking to anybody? And we sometimes will justify it that what we did was correct, but it doesn't matter because the people aren't in our lives anymore. And we yearn for those relationships again. I, am I the only one? We yearn for them, but we go, God, but I, I don't know what else I could have done. And they rejected me. I'm done. And so what we learn to do is we learn to stuff that emotion, get over it, and move on. And we go find other relationships that are fine for periods of time. And I was like, man, Lord, what, why are you dealing with this me? I, you know, and then he's, he tells me, while he's giving me these verses, he says, yeah, I want you to share this on Tuesday. I was like, you're going to make me be that vulnerable? You're going to make me be honest with people? <laughs> when I was little, I had a friend. His name was Ernie. Ernie was my best friend. When I was about eight years old, I did everything with Ernie. Ernie, Ernie's parents, uh, I, li I grew up in South Africa, and his parents were, were from Sweden. And Ernie was cool. His dad owned a printing, printing press shop, and we would go down there, and I remember doing stuff with him, and he taught me some cool things because he could do pretty much everything. But we were really best friends. And I had a brother that was really mean. He was, in fact, he, he didn't walk with God. In fact, during his teen years, he literally gave himself to the devil, literally. And um, he had to be delivered of that. And he's a very godly man today. But in those days, he wasn't all that godly. He's six years older than me. And I remember the day, because my brother was older, he was cooler. And when you're a little kid, you are always working at trying to figure out how you can be cool but an older kid comes along, and they're always cooler than the younger kid. Anybody know this one? Yeah. Okay. My brother was cool. In fact, he was cool. I mean, in those days, he was really cool. He had, you know, he had the bell-bottom jeans, and he was, just, he was just the cool kid. Long hair. And uh, my brother stole my best friend from me. And it hurt me. And it would take me, and I'm bringing that up for, for a reason. It would take me years to overcome that. To literally, when I'm at my adult years, I literally approached my brother. I said, dude, I just need to 
release you from something that I've been holding a grudge again. This is after he's saved and everything else. I mean, years later, and it's like a childhood thing. It was like, but I recognized something. I recognized that what it produced in my life at that point in time was the sense that I was always scared that I was going to lose those who were closest to me. Through the years, there would be subsequent things that would occur till eventually, when you're in ministry, if there's one thing that is, <laughs> that is repeatable in ministry is that people will do things to hurt you where you've been really close to people and all of a sudden they hurt you, they wound you, and you don't know what to do. As a pastor, it's one of the most horrible things to deal with because what happens is, as a pastor, you're not allowed to say what happens. Anybody who understands ministry knows this part. So basically, people on the outside are looking at you, and it doesn't matter what the other person did. They're watching you, and if you use their name, you say this name out loud, negatively, you as a pastor are the wrong one. But what they don't really understand is that even though, even though these things occurred, the issue is the issue of the heart. Remember, Jesus talked about the issues of the heart. The issue of the heart is it hurt, and so I am I'm sharing emotion because I'm hurt. Because a relationship that I had got severed and broken. And as I was thinking about this one particular thing that occurred, and I, I was just like, the Lord just go, whoa. I was like, God... You know, Will and I were just talking beginning, at the beginning here, we were talking about in the church, there's so much competition, so much rivalry, so much insane, you know, people working against each other. It's bizarre. It is really crazy. And, and yet we're called into the body to bring unity. And it's one of the most difficult things you can, you can face because it's like, no, we're supposed to be together, but I don't like you. I don't like what you're doing. I, I hate what you're doing, but I like you. I want to be a part of what this, this kingdom is. I want to see the kingdom unfold. I want to bless you. I want you to be blessed. I want the spirit of God to come on you. I want you to understand I'm for you. I'm not against you. No, you're against me because I can tell you're doing. And it's like, come on, Really? I didn't follow Jesus to come against you. I came, came to follow Jesus to follow Jesus. I actually believe that the church is going to be in unity one day because it's his dream. And God's dreams always come true. And so as I'm wrestling with this, I began realizing that what we do as humans Ready? I'm going to give you a secret. I'm going to give you a major secret because it was like the Lord just unpacked it. I went, oh, man, so good. What you do when you really are afraid that you're going to lose somebody or afraid you're going to lose some sense of traction in your purpose and what God's called you to, what happens is you grab it and hold it tighter. You cling. So Jesus turns me to the passage in John chapter 20. Verse 14, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God, your God. I said, Lord, what are you saying? He said, sometimes, Danny, in our lives, our lives, there are things that are cut off so that faith can rise. There are things that are difficult so that you can believe that what he said, he meant. Jesus had promised he'd be back, hadn't he? Mary comes, the first thing she does, she clings to him. I'm not losing you again. And Jesus' response, it was amazing. He said, don't cling. I got things to do that the Father wants me still to do. I still have to go to my dad. Uh, there are things that I've been called to do. And sometimes there are people in our lives who the Spirit of God is saying, listen, don't cling. I have things to do in their life. It's my will. I am pulling them to me. I am doing something in their lives. I am trying to release on them something that is yet to come in their lives. Don't cling. We will always be one. Jesus in John chapter 14, he says this. He says, listen, I'm, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I will not orphan you. I will never orphan you. Say, I will never be an orphan. Never. Be an orphan. never. You know why? <laughs> because Jesus said it. Not because of your experience. It's not based upon the experiences you have that determine whether or not you're an orphan. The reality is, is that Jesus said you'll never be an orphan. So therefore, guess what? I will never be an orphan. I will never be an orphan. He will never orphan me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. In fact, he says, I will come to you. Incidentally, it's very interesting where he says, I'm going to come to you is directly in context to you doing the kingdom. It has nothing to do with, I'm just going to come to you when you're doing nothing. He's, but, but in the context of you releasing kingdom, he says, I'm going to be there right with you. I want you to know. You're going to know. When, when you're in the kingdom, you're going to know. I'm a colleague with you. I'm walking with you. I'm talking with you. I'm hanging on to you. I'm there with you all the time. And so there's something about Jesus coming with us. But the reality is, is that what we have to learn is we have to learn in our relationships with each other as, as strong as they're supposed to be. And I've been talking about the early uh, first century church. And, and the second century, and I've talked about how they were family, they loved each other. And there's a difference, the difference between love and clinging. Clinging does not allow people to grow. Clinging is, will not let people uh, ascend to their father. But there must come a time in our lives where we begin understanding, I can't cling to anything. I can't hold this. This is God working in their life. And I must rejoice in the fact that God is working in their life. That as soon as I start clinging, Jesus is going to say, stop it. But what happens is when we begin clinging to people, we drive them away. We do. We drive them away. When you begin clinging, they immediately go, man, stop it. I, I just need some space. I, just leave me alone. All right, is anybody hearing me? Is there anybody else who deals with any of this? Am I just talking to myself? It's something the Lord's dealing with. He is, listen, he has not dealt with it. He is dealing with it. Are you with me? I want to get pretty real with you. I, I want you to understand that I'm not perfect with this. But it's real, and it's, it's, it's relational. And, and if the kingdom and the, and the body of Christ is going to be anything, it's going to have to be relational. We're going to have to understand that there is breathing in the body, that in the relationships we're going to have, that God is going to put two of us together, and the person who might have always gone with you is going to have to go with somebody else. And you have to recognize that God is doing this. This is, not, this is not just somebody rejecting you. It's the fact that in the flow of things that are happening in the spirit, you have to learn to flow. Listen, this is what happened even with our worship. When I talked about worship before, let me tell you, 15 worship leaders. I was one of them. Do you know how ridiculous that is? We weren't that big of a ministry, but we had 15 worship leaders. We had 55 different musicians involved. When we did a conference, that's what we would have. 
And people are like, when do I get to play? That wasn't the issue. It was like, all we want, the whole focus was, we want God there. We don't care who leads. We don't care who plays. We want Jesus there. There's something, there's something that shifts inside of you when you begin understanding that what we want is what, we, is what God wants. We want him moving in here. We want him coming in here. We want God to begin releasing. We want some, I want some of you, listen, I want some of you so bad to grab the mic and say, I got a word from the Lord. I'm not somebody who needs the mic. I'm not somebody who needs to speak. I believe that God is going to raise up incredible champions, incredible releasers of the grace of God, whether that be through speaking or through music or through prophecy or through whatever. I believe in you because you got the same Holy Ghost that I got. He apportioned it to all of us. We all get him. He's a seal. He's the promise. He is the promise. He said, listen, here's my promise to you that I'm coming again. You ready? I'm putting something, I'm putting someone inside of you. That's my promise. I will never take him from you. You will never lose him. Some of you that don't feel like you're filled with the spirit or, or that you just aren't feeling, you're, you're a heretic. Because the Bible teaches that you have him. You feel like I'm not hearing God. That's heresy. <laughs> really, it's false teaching. You're hearing God. You're just preferring your own emotions. You're preferring your own unbelief system that is in place. You're preferring that and you're valuing that higher than the fact Holy Spirit's all over you. You know, the word that somebody had, John had, the word that actually Tina had, where people are supposed to be healed, that's going to happen tonight. But I think one of the things that's going to happen is going to be, you're going to be healed in an area of your life that maybe, maybe isn't going to be a physical thing. It may be tonight. But some of you are going to be healed and recognize, you know what? God's going to begin healing. I'm going to begin valuing what God's doing in other people when he's doing it with them, even if they're not doing it with me. Hmm. Really? And it doesn't mean I have to do what they do. I just have to listen to Papa. You have to listen to Papa. You have to listen to Papa. Don't be afraid of people experiencing something where God just says for a season, I'm doing something. Don't cling. Don't cling. Don't cling. Here's what I know about Jesus. He wouldn't let Mary cling. And now the whole earth is following him. Can I tell you one other facet of it? You ready? Flip it. Don't let people cling to you. Don't let people value you so much that they feel they can't do life without you because that's called idolatry. So this whole thing of clinging one way or the other, you don't let people around your life, you say, yo, I am a servant of God. Do you remember at the end of Revelation? Do you remember John falls down before the angel? The angel says, yo, no, <laughs> this ain't happening. I'm just one of you. As soon as people begin to feel like they, they're it. I'm the next big prophet. I'm the next big apostle. This is the next big move of God. This is the next, next, next. As soon as you start believing that about yourself, ah, that's where you go, no, 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 no. Do I believe in what I'm doing? Absolutely. Do I believe it's the most important thing in the world? Absolutely. You know why? Because God gave it to me to do. But I believe that what he's called you to do Amen. for you better be the most important thing in the world for you to do. Big difference. 
But if I feel like you have to do what I do in order for you to be significant, that's called idolatry. And that's a religious spirit. So I want to break that over, over us tonight. We're all in different facets of that, you know? We could have a scale. And some of you, I think we probably all deal with it, do, do we? To some degree? And um, rejection is one of the most wicked things. Because Jesus came, and he was rejected by his own. He understands rejection. They didn't receive him. But to as many as received him, he gave the power to become children of God. But then when they rejected him, he never rejected them. Did you hear that? He never rejected them. On the cross, Father, forgive them. That's incredible. They rejected him. He's saying, Father, forgive them. Don't count it to them. Don't hold it against them. Lord, release them from, the, from any guilt they might feel. Lord, Lord, I, I, Lord Father, don't, don't let any of that happen to them. He, he understood the power of rejection. See, because rejection carries in it the seed of bitterness and a place for unforgiveness to root. So you got to get rid of your rejection. You got to stop believing the whole world's against you. When I was a teenager, I came from South Africa. And coming from South Africa, I used to talk like a South African. And in junior high, you don't want to be different. You want to be the same. Teacher comes, comes into class. I stand at attention. Principal walks in the classroom. I stand up next to my desk. And all the kids are going, this kid's weird. It was the culture I grew up in. It was very British. I asked the teacher after class, can I carry your books? Everybody's like, brown noser. <laughs> it's what we were taught. It was just manners. That's all it was. But immediately, I, I, I went through incredible rejection where literally day after day after day, I was teased and beaten up. I would go home every day weeping. My mom would weep every day afraid of what happened that day to her son. I went through rejection, extreme. I wanted to kill myself. I didn't want to live. I didn't understand that because I'd been a very happy boy. My family didn't understand it. I'd been a very happy boy. But what happened was I allowed that seed. You know, it's, it's that, that little story, that, that little song that kids, you know, um, Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. Big, fat, juicy ones. Little, little, skinny ones. See how they wiggle and squirm. <laughs> and I remember my dad looking at me one day. And he was actually saying something from God, but I couldn't receive it at that point. It would take me years to understand. He said, stop feeling sorry for yourself and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I didn't like it when he gave it but he was right. Because I was just feeling sorry for myself. Everybody, nobody likes me. Nobody really understands who I am. Nobody really, and so they reject me. And as a result of this rejection, I was responding in my relationship. I couldn't make friends because nobody wants to be friends with a person who's feeling rejected. They will self-reject you. It's like in a, you're in a rejection bomb. <laughs> you're like, nobody likes me. It's like, what did you do? You're pretty, you know, you can be really nice. What did you do with them? But I had to learn to deal with myself. I had to learn to understand that rejection is something I have to deal with because as soon as I just felt sorry for myself, I couldn't learn to love. Because it says you can't love unless you love yourself. And by their rejection, I was looking at my own life and saying, I'm a reject. But I had to learn, God made Danny as he made Danny. God wanted Danny on the earth. He wanted him for such a time as this. God loves me. God has never rejected me. God has never turned me aside. He came to me. 
And he redeemed me. He loved me. He poured into me. He gave me life. And as soon as I began to understand, as I looked in the mirror to my, to my chubby face and zits, I went, Jesus loves you. And God is all over you. I began understanding that we cannot reject ourselves. We don't cling to others. We don't receive that spirit of rejection that comes there. We say, God's got something going on in their life. That's okay. That's good. We're good. We trust God. But I also understand that God's got a call on our lives. And so we're valuable. So we get to do what Jesus has called us to do. Don't we, Allison? And it's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful what Jesus does with that. I want you to open your hands up. We're going to break this sucker. I speak to rejection. That spirit. The spirit that incites bitterness, unforgiveness, even hatred in some cases, because you feel so rejected. I speak to that spirit right now that comes and it literally wraps its, itself inside of you where your own emotions begin to defend its reason for being there. I break the power of that in Jesus' name right now. I command that rejection spirit to leave every person in this room, that there will be no more effect of rejection in your life, that there will be no more impact of rejection where you feel you people don't understand you. I want you to know God understands you, and he's the only one that matters who understands you. And God has you on a course that is set for destiny and purpose your whole life. That God will not reject you now or in the future. God is for you. He is not against you. So I release that. I release that. I release that all over your lives. I command life where there's been death. Where the, where the sowing of death in your very being has been sown. I command that to break. I command spirits of anger and rage leave now in Jesus' name. I speak. I speak as one who understands, and I have authority. I have authority. Spirit of rejection, get out. Spirit of fear, get out. Spirit of apprehension of the future and what will happen, get out. Some of you are married and you're afraid that divorce might happen. Get out. Some of you are afraid you just got a good job. You're afraid you're going to lose it. Get out. Some of you are afraid of great relationships you have. You're afraid that something's going to happen and sever. In Jesus' name, get out. Get out. It creates a weirdness in relationship. Get out. And I release right now the grace of Jesus to walk with God and to walk with each other as real brothers and sisters. That we are family. We are really family. And God is doing things in every single one of us. Not one above another. Not one lower than another. He's doing something with every single one of us. That it doesn't matter what you do in the kingdom. The pay is the same. The pay is the same. It doesn't matter if you're called to preach or if you're called to take out the trash. The pay is the same. It is all the same. It doesn't matter if you raise the dead. Are you just loving a neighbor? The pay is the same. You're just called to love. You're called to release what Jesus has called you to release. There is no one above another. There is no man, no woman above another. Stop looking. Listen, stop watching your YouTube and idolizing people and saying, I want to be like them. Stop it. Stop it. You don't want to be like them. You want to be like you. Because Jesus made you you and i release that right now an anointing to be you an anointing to be you holy spirit on you holy spirit on you holy spirit on you 
that the Holy Spirit is, is for you. It's going to look different on you than it's going to look on me. It's going to look different on every single person in this room. But it's the Holy Spirit on you. He likes you. He likes you. He likes you.